At this point, I've written over 5,000 lines of Leptos code. Leptos being the Rust framework that I'm using to build my web UI using Wasm. And this is what it's like to build a Leptos application. So let's start off easy with styling. Styling is accomplished using Tailwind. I don't have, or I don't need a package JSON, although I do have one and I'm using NPX to actually execute Tailwind. Any CSS solution will work here. Just as a command runner, much like npm run or a make file or whatever. So in this case, I run just Tailwind and that watches my Tailwind input file and just dumps the output file into style output.css, which brings us to cargo leptos. So cargo leptos is a cargo subcommand that kind of abstracts cargo a little bit to build the front end and server applications for your leptos application. The server in this case for me is running locally because this is an admin application. It's not really meant to be deployed anywhere. And the client is bundled as Wasm and delivered to your browser. So to compile both of these applications, you use cargo leptos watch. I'm using op run no masking because I'm using one password to store all my environment variables because I can just show you kind of like the secrets that I have here. In this case, this is uh, the location of a one password ID that stores the database URL. And in this way, basically I can show what's in my nvrc and I'm using durenv to get those environment variables into my uh, terminal. And I don't need to worry about exposing service credentials when I'm recording videos or anything like that. So op run no masking allows me to take those environment variables that are IDs to the 1Password and then ask 1Password to like unmask them or unencrypt them for me. So cargo leptos watch is really the command that we want to run. And then 1Password will ask me and I'll use my fingerprint because I'm on a Mac, at which point a bunch of things compile. I've already compiled, so it happens pretty quickly. And you can see that I'm using SQL X because as of version six, I believe they still don't sort of integrate with tracing very well. And it's now listening on some port on uh, 127001, so localhost. And if I go over and I refresh, this is the application. It's not terribly interesting as an application goes. I've got a side navigation, so I can click on the collections here. I've got some data here. This is the new infrastructure for Rust Adventure, so not all the data is here yet, but I can uh, find a workshop basically, say 2048. I can find the versions of that workshop. So in this case, this is the Bevy 0.6 version, and I still need to upload the other versions for say Bevy 0.10 and things like that. So I'll click on that and it'll load in. And now I'm looking at 2048 with Bevy ECS with the sort of thumbnail that you see if you see the collections page and a list of all the lessons in order that I can then go in and edit. So for example, I can click on one of these and it'll load. And on the right hand side, we see a bunch of metadata, playback ID, description for the lesson, some other details, uh, the display name for the lesson, which is what people see. Uh, there's diffs for every lesson. So the change in code that happens between one lesson and another, the amount of time it takes for the video to run so that people know how long a video takes and things like that. And then uh, this kind of poorly formatted, like the lesson contents, which is entirely markdown which is kind of like the the written portion of the lesson so if you want to watch the video you watch the video if you want to read you can read and this is the admin application so you can see that there's different displays so there's diff there's video in this case uh, a bunch of these don't have the post yet because i haven't uploaded it and a bunch of them don't have the diff links because i haven't <laughs> uploaded it yet but they do have the videos and that's all this is so the application itself isn't terribly difficult but it is quite a bit of uh I guess HTML and CSS, web UI, but the UIs are fairly standard. The things that need to happen for these forms are you click save and the request goes and it saves and you're done. <laughs> but it is important to show so that you understand what's going on when I show you the code. Let's get rid of the terminal. And you can see I'm using some main commit uh, for Leptos, which is kind of what I often use. I don't use the released versions. I use the whatever's in the main branch, but I don't want that to change from day to day. So I end up using the built-in ability for Cargo to use a GitHub uh, URL revision. And then there's a bunch of dependencies. A lot of these are labeled optional true because some of them only need to be compiled for say the server. For example, you can see SQL X here is labeled as optional because we don't want SQL X to be compiled to Wasm. It's not something we're going to be using from inside the browser. So you can see that when we enable different features such as hydrate, which would mean the client or SSR, which would mean the server, we can specify which dependencies we actually want to include in that binary. So Axum in Tokyo, for example, SQL X, all things that run on the server, and the things that run on the client are kind of like Leptos Hydrate, uh, different features that Leptos offers. Now, because we use Cargo Leptos, there's quite a bit of configuration here. 
for different kinds of things. I'm not gonna go over them all. You can go read the comments if you want to. So let's start with server functions because I think those are the most interesting part for the admin application itself because the admin application is basically, here's a bunch of CRUD operations that you can do to uh, update the data in the database without having to like open a MySQL shell. So let's start with what it looks like to use one of these. And in this case, we're using a server action that calls an update lesson server function or creates a server action using the update lesson server function. And then we use action form with that action to actually let it work. And what this does is allows us to build a regular form with all of your typical HTML names and IDs and whatever that will get serialized and sent to the server whenever we submit this form. So the key things here are we're using action form with some action. We can use server functions to create a server action that we use as that form action. And that form action is then like all the serialization of this form data is handled for us, which is really nice in the context of an admin app. So update lesson here takes quite a few arguments. Now, one of the things you're supposed to be able to do is co-locate these server functions with the code that's calling them. I haven't fully come around to that yet, and I'll tell you why that is in a second. So I've got this lessons.rs file, which has a bunch of the server functions that I'm using in different places. I've got data structures for the data as it exists in the database. So I call this like SQL lesson. And I've got data structures that represent the serialized like in browser version of the data structure. And then I have an, a from implementation that takes the database structure and converts it into kind of like what I want to use in the browser. And normally you wouldn't need to do this because you would just be serializing it to JSON. But in this case, what we're doing is actually handling the data on the server as the SQL data structure. And then we're passing it to the client, which is also written in Rust. So what we actually want here is a data structure that we can use and manipulate on the client, as well as a data structure that we can use and manipulate on the server. And those are gonna have different uh, feature sets, basically. For example, on the server, I use this RAID type, which is a KSUID. And on the client, we treat those as just strings. So back to our update lesson server function, we use the server macro to create a server function. This server function happens to hit a URL at slash API. Um, and the name of the function is something like update lesson and then a hash. So this macro takes this function, which is an async function and turns it into something you can call on the client as well as something you can call on the server. This code only runs on the server. So the body of this function will only ever run on the server, but we can pass the same arguments in on the server or on the client, which makes it kind of easier to use whenever you're gonna use it in any given place. So this will do basically the compilation for the server version of this and the client version of this and allows us to use it as if we're just calling like update lesson or whatever. All of these fields here are fields in the action form that we looked at earlier. So we didn't have to write any extra code to serialize this data. It just kind of like happened for us because Leptos um, is dealing with pulling the information out of the form, serializing it and sending it to us. So for example, we get a lesson ID, which is a string, which we need to turn back into a KSUID to interact with SQL X. We need to get a connection to, for example, our database. In this case, I'm pulling the MySQL pool from context, getting a connection from that pool, and then using SQL X with this SQL file and whatever got passed in to update that lesson. And this is the way that the entire admin app has been built. So these action forms and server functions have been such an incredible productivity boon for me, honestly. And of course, if I expand the uh, files on the right, you can see just how many of these SQL files and server functions that I'm working with here. Application isn't finished, so this isn't a complete set of everything that I will end up with. But if we go into lesson update, you can see that I've got update lessons, set these things, which are the items that I'm passing in, where ID equals whatever. And this actually works really well. Now there's two Two really important things to note, one of which is that when we declare this server function, the code generation happens here. And we need to tell the Leptos application on the server about this somehow. And this gets into why I don't necessarily co-locate these with the component code that's using them, because we need to run this sort of register function, right? So somewhere in our main server, I'm using Axum. So when I'm booting my Axum server, we do things like create the connection pool, and then we need to register our server functions, and then we can deal with the application setup. But if we go to the definition of this function, you'll see that for all of the server functions I've created, uh, for collections, for workshops, for lessons, for the contents of lessons, for articles, et cetera, you need to register those. And theoretically, all of those could fail, so you have to unwrap them or you have to use the result really. So you end up with this like giant 
swath of server functions that you need to register. And it's just easier for me to not have these scattered all across my application when I am dealing with this file. Because if you don't register them, the server functions will fail at runtime when you try to like use it in your client code. So for me, it's a lot easier to have this extra file. So you can see all of my server functions are defined in these modules. And I just have this register SQL server functions. And anytime that I am working in this SQLs folder, um, anytime I create one of these server functions, I go back into this SQL file and I register this function. I'm not super happy about needing to do this registration, manually at least. Um, and I hope that at some point in the future, this will get automated, but it's also not too bad. I wish we could automate this, but I would also settle for some kind of compiler enforced, like if this exists, then it has to have been registered uh, because I have forgotten to register some of them. And one thing that you will find out is that if you register these server functions and you do a new deployment, but let's say, somebody hasn't hit refresh yet and you've redeployed the urls for these uh let's just click one of these here the urls for these are something like fetch lesson can't <laughs> make the right thing big here the urls for these are something like fetch lesson and then some number right but this number will change with every like change to a server function or every deployment so what you end up with is if somebody hasn't refreshed and loaded the new wasm code then this url won't exist in the new deployment not a huge deal for me with this admin app a big of a bigger deal in uh the production rest adventure site but overall not something i'm terribly worried about at the moment the other really important thing for server functions is that we do need to provide say the mysql pool as context and to do that we need to use these kind of like wrapper functions so here i've got a function called server function handler with these are kind of scattered all across my application right now these only compile this item if it's the server. So this is how you can make sure that something isn't being compiled into the client. Uh, we get the extension that contains the MySQL pool, and then we have to call this handle server functions with context. And that's where we provide the MySQL pool as context to the Leptos application. So this is what allows us to go into these server functions and use context on this MySQL pool and get the actual MySQL pool so that we can get a connection to the database. And that's pretty much it. It's a lot of using this component macro, writing a function, using scope, taking some props, creating server actions to interact with forms, or just rendering things out. So for example, we've got this workshop header component and it takes a scope because everything takes a scope, every component takes a scope. And then we've got a collection or a, a version for props and they all implement into view. Uh, these HTML blocks aren't auto formatable yet. I think there's a project uh, inside of the Leptos organization that is trying to work on that, but I don't have it currently working. So you end up with say image source equals collection dot thumbnail. You don't need braces around these attributes, but you do need braces around the content of these tags or the children of these tags. But other than that, it's basically just writing HTML passing in these props or passing in the data that you want and the locations that you need it. And it's just like writing any other uh, HTML UI. Um, loading is also interesting. So we talked about server functions, but let's talk a little bit about resources. So here on the lessons page, for example, let's get all the way to the left. Here on the lessons page, we've got a component that takes the scope and returns some view. I'm creating a signal here to determine whether we should be editing a lesson or not. As a brief reminder, that's whenever you click one of these and this right-hand side shows up. So we create a signal with an option string, starting out as none, so none is selected. Um, and if there's a sum, then there is a lesson selected. The Leptos router crate allows us to use a params map. So for lessons here, if we go into our app, there's a router as you would probably expect. This is pretty typical these days. And then we can see the lessons component being used here for the route path collection slug version version. And these two slug and version are going to be the names of the uh, params in the path that we can access. So inside of this lessons component, we can use params map and then we can params.get with that name, clone it and unwrap it um, or default it. In this case, that would mean that we get a empty string. But that brings us into talking about resources. So resources are how I've been using server functions to fetch any data from the database whenever the page loads or a specific component loads more accurately. So we create a resource with the current scope 
the first closure tells us when to refetch this basically. So in this case, whenever slug or version change, in this case, they, they don't change for the component because we're on a URL and whatever, but we get slug and version as arguments to the second function or second closure. And I'm using the futures crate to join a couple of these server functions together. So we've got fetch collection, fetch version, and fetch all for version, which are all server functions. And they each take the slug, some of them take the version, and this will give us back a tuple. So a three tuple of the result. The really interesting thing that we can do with resources, so this is let resources equals create resource, is we can use these suspense components to automatically handle rendering a fallback or rendering data. So in this case, we've got suspense, we've got fallback, which is just loading for now. And this resources.read is a reactive read, so this will update anytime resources changes. In this case, if there's no resource, then I'm not rendering anything. If there's some resource, then we have that three tuple in here. So collection version and whatever the third one was, I think it was lessons. And we just use a regular match statement to return some view. Views always take the scope. And we've got workshop header here as the component and a div in this other one. So the match arms have to match, which is why I'm using these fragments. So the fragments get the types to match. And then workshop header is the component that we saw earlier. It takes collection and version as props. And that's it. So the resource will handle kind of dealing with checking to see if something is loaded or not, render a fallback if it's not. And if we have our data, then we can render whatever we want. So in this case, I've got two, uh, I've got the workshop header kind of suspense component and the lessons suspense component. And if I click through here again, after I click on the version, you'll see two loading indicators in the top left, which are both of those loading indicators for the suspense components, and then everything renders in. In this case, all of the data is being fetched at the same time, so it's not like they come in at different times or anything, but they could. I could have different resources for each of the data. So overall, very uh, productive experience. I will say that if we look at the app, the style sheet has an ID of Leptos here. So the compiled CSS file is being hot loaded. Um, actually, the entire uh, page here is being reloaded anytime I update, so I don't need to worry about coming in here and doing manual refreshes or whatnot. And I can change whatever I want and it'll just show up. So overall, a pretty productive experience. This is kind of what it's like to work with Leptos. I hope you enjoyed this uh, short dive into this admin app that I'm building, and I'll catch you in the next video. Have a great rest of your day.